how preachers want order and don't help you with order. We want them to bring stuff to put in the Okay, I, yeah, I'll mention it. All right, if you can quickly take your seats. Thank you. You can quickly take your seats. Um, one of the geniuses of, the, of, of Ellison Jones is the diversity of voices. Already, we've seen a queen mother and we've seen a spiritual daughter preach. There was a day where the pipeline to the School of Theology was clear. If a graduate pastored, they directed their sons and daughters to the seminary. That's how I got here. My brother directed me to the School of Theology in 1988. I started my journey. In 1988, I started my journey because my brother was trained, equipped, and prepared in this context. So, one of the great things about this school is that it produces its own voices. It produces its own voices. There are several faculty members who are graduates of the School of Theology. I'm a two-time graduate, School of Theology. There are plenty, there's a few of us around. We produce our own. We produce our own. And, and this man is a graduate of this school uh, and he's one of the most uh, caring professors we have. Uh, he rarely gets excited. I mean, rarely means, rarely may be rarely to the rarely. <laughs> but more importantly, he helps to shape the context of how we think theologically and in terms of ethics. And so I want us to honor Dr. Sylvester Smith as he comes to present this morning. Can we celebrate Dr. Sylvester Smith? I thank God for grace and mercy. I think I thank God for Dean and his assigning me this obligation. I thank all of my colleagues, my students presently, and those who have graduated a minute ago. It's just good to be here. I'm hesitating because this spot is hot. Sister stirred up some stuff up here. You stick your chest out when students have come through your class and they do so well. We thank God. Please allow me a <clears throat> moment of personal privilege. My wife is here today, Ruby. If the Lord spares our lives and tarries his coming, Valentine's Day 2024, we will have been married for 52 years. <laughs> she is and has always been the wind beneath my wing. For the time that we have to share this morning, this is a lecture. I know y'all. <laughs> Eternal God, our Father, help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Amen. I was intrigued by our theme this year, preaching and social justice, 
preaching liberation in perilous times. My intrigue made me take a closer look, and I asked myself, what are some of the ethical presuppositions and implications of our theme? There seems to be a symbiotic relationship operative here with the various elements of the theme. To actualize social justice and liberation, preaching is necessary. But what does our theme say about the contextual reality that we find ourselves in, a reality that we are now trying to address? If we must preach liberation, then it presupposes that there is already a flaw in socialization. It presupposes further that the capacity for correcting the flaw is also there. If the capacity is not there for such correction, then the whole enterprise is illusory and we are deluding ourselves. We run the risk, as others have done in the past, of creating a genre of preaching that is talking loud and saying nothing. Anyone who has not been living in a cave, under a rock, or on a deserted, deserted island knows we are living in extremely dangerous, violent, and vicious days, perilous times. In the last couple of decades, times have rapidly grown worse and worse. Evil is rampant. No longer are we in a situation where our children are safe in school. No longer can one feel safe attending a worship service. No longer is it morally depraved behavior frowned upon, but is embraced as normal. Mass shootings have become commonplace. The sanctity of life has been tossed overboard, and perverted moral behavior has become accepted as normal. These are perilous times. In too many sectors of our society, individuals are seemingly devoid of a moral compass, and many among us seek to rid society of any reliance upon the God of the Bible. You and I are called to speak prophetically and to repair the breaches in our society during these perilous times. There is toxic polarization, an immoral and broken immigration system, systemic racism, assault on democracy, a culture where war is scapegoating LGBT youth, a climate crisis, the devastation of war, and a resurgence of white nationalism. These are perilous times. The Apostle Paul told his young protege Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, the following, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. People will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends and be reckless and puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. These are perilous times, and the perilous times which Paul spoke of are here as preachers of this marvelous gospel. You and I must be committed to making racial and social justice become central to the Christian faith and discipleship. But hold up, Dr. Smith, what? Just what is social justice? I'm so glad you asked. You may remember a few years ago that radio host Glenn Beck made the absurd remark that social justice has the same philosophy as Nazis and communism and that it's a phrase that is a catchword for both of them. He brazenly said, and I quote, I beg you to look for the word social justice or economic justice on your church website. If you find it, run as fast as you can. Social justice and economic justice are code words. 
Am I advising people to leave their church? Yes. Unquote. Such statements can be safely made without pushback during a monologue, but the very nature and absurdity of such a claim demands a conversation. More recently, John MacArthur, you might recognize the name, has said that you do not find social justice as such in the Bible. He claimed that those who advocate for social justice are saying that some in our society have been treated unjustly and now it is time for society to treat them justly. He claims further that advocates of social justice claim that they have been deprived of privilege, power, prosperity, position, property, and status in the culture. They have been victimized and they do not have what the powerful people have and consequently there is no social justice for them. His thesis is this. Social justice is not a part of the gospel. He goes a step further and claims that social justice is a hindrance to the gospel. My time this morning does not afford me the opportunity to push back on MacArthur as I would like. So I await my ethics students, Carl Hill, to take sanctified pen to paper and dress this brother down. Suffice it to say, sisters and brothers, these are perilous times. When during civil conversations, conversations based on facts and not on some conspiracy theory or divisive agenda, it can be concluded that social justice refers to a fair and equitable distribution of resources, the opportunities and privileges in society. Originally a religious concept, it has come to be capitalized more loosely as the just organization of social institutions that deliver access to economic benefits. In theoretical terms, Social justice is often understood to be equivalent to justice itself. However, that concept is defined. Many narrower interpretations conceive of social justice as being equivalent to or partly constitutive of distributive justice. That is, the fair and equitable distribution of social, political, and economic benefits and burdens. According to some interpretations, Social justice also encompasses, among other conditions, the equal opportunity to contribute to and benefit from the common good, including by holding public office. Other interpretations promote the stronger goal of equal participation by all individuals and groups in all major social, political, and economic institutions. Social justice is a broad term. And there are many variations in how advocates apply the perspective. Adam Russell Taylor, president of Sojourners, suggests that social determinants like the race, racial wealth gap or inequitable access to health care feature heavily in social justice analysis. Some applications relate to social justice such as rate, critical race theory, and they have become a battleground for American politics. You listen to the news. The Bible makes social justice a mandate of faith and a fundamental expression of Christian discipleship despite what MacArthur and others might say. Social justice has its biblical roots in a triune God who repeatedly shows God's love and compassion for the weak, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, and the disinherited. In reflections on advocacy and justice, Tim Dearborn posited the notion that for Christians, the pursuit of social justice for the poor and oppressed is the de decisive mark of being people who submit to the will and the way of God. We are encouraged, you and I, in Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute, Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. As Christians, the building blocks of social justice lie in human dignity, human flourishing, and the sacredness of life. Biblical references to the word justice mean to make right. 
justice is primarily a relational term, people living in relationship with God, one another, and the natural creation. From a scripture point of view, justice means loving our neighbor, Dr. Goochamp, as we love ourselves and is rooted in the character and the nature of God. As God is loving and just, we are called to do justice and to live in love. Dr. Goochamp told us last night that social justice is our mantra here at STVU. The source of of social justice is God's perfect righteousness, justice, and radical love. As proclaimers of this marvelous gospel, how do we manifest God's perfect righteousness, God's justice, God's radical love to the souls to whom God has called us to minister? In these perilous times in which we live, at this moment, times in which we uh, find it difficult to move forward sometimes, is there any words from the Lord to the preacher for God's people? If so, what is it? Well, according to Reverend Dr. James Henry Harris, distinguished professor and chair of homiletics and research scholar in religion at the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology here at Virginia Union University and pastor of the Second Baptist Church in the near West End here in our city, he said that preaching liberation should be the starting point of our proclamation because liberation preaching is preaching that is transformational. He contends further that liberation is a precondition to transformation. This means that before one can change one's life situation, one needs to be free to do so. If this is indeed the mandate for the preacher, then what are we to preach? Further, if preaching social justice and liberation are not, you hear me, are not included in our agendas as proclaimers of the gospel, if we fail to preach what needs to be preached, what are the ethical presuppositions and implications of our inaction? Well, let me uh, see if I can point us in a direction where some answers may lie. Black churches have always served as moral, social, and political sanctuaries for black people during eras defined by struggle, like this present time. There was a time in a bygone era when voices were raised in defense of the least, the lost, the left out, and the marginalized during eras defined by struggle. The Bible verse most quoted by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was Amos 5.24. You know it. But let justice roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. The prophet Amos was saying, as most of the Hebrew prophets were saying, Dr. Waffle Fanaka, that what God wants is justice and right living rather than religious ceremonies for their own sake. If we simply do church, church, and ignore the injustice in our society, it is a gross and monumental understatement to say we disappoint God. Amos says that God finds church like that disgusting. I do not want your offerings, the Lord says. I cannot stand the noise of your praise song and your organ preludes. If you do not want to do justice, get out of my house. The prophet Jeremiah in his temple sermon in Jeremiah 7, 1 through 15, echoes the words of Amos. Therein, Jeremiah declared that simply mentioning or being in the temple were deceptive words. The temple could not provide protection or security when social injustice was rampant. Social justice was about human to human relationships, fairness, equity, or the right treatment of those such as the poor, widows, orphans, and strangers. Only then could people claim to worship God appropriately. I was intrigued by our theme this year, preaching social justice and preaching liberation in perilous times. And my, my intrigue led me to a text in Deutero-Isaiah. Hear now the words from the prophet in chapter 51, verses 1 through 3. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock 
from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. As it relates to our theme and this scripture, some might be wondering, what perilous times? Well, let me shed a little light that might answer that question. Perilous times are obvious here because at the time of the text I just read, the captives found themselves in the latter stages of exile. Some had already gone home, but some had become comfortable in exile, and that's perilous. Some individuals in the community were glorifying exile, and that was perilous. Some of them had learned how to be comfortable in exile despite the arduous nature of that exile, and that was a perilous thing. As it relates to us, in case we want to frown at the Israelites so many centuries ago, maybe some of our behavior is indicative of our having accepted the normativity of exile. As a result, many of us have lost that energy of liberation and social justice because we have bought into the categories and we're trying to get our own. Preachers, sister pastor, brother pastor, the sad commentary is that too many instances, our people have become the other. In the context of our text, we were sent to, and some of us were sent back to, the black community with an opportunity to restore the community. But herein lies the problem. Too many of us, not in this sanctuary, but too many of us uh, are going to and going back to the black community with exile religion, exile attitudes, exile practices, and exile worldviews none of which serve the purpose of social justice and liberation. You and I are living in perilous times. We are on the doorstep of freedom, but it has not been actualized yet. Some of us have lost the energy and the focus for both teaching and preaching anything that resembles liberation, social justice, or freedom, and we become consumed and enamored with comfort in exile. Brothers and sisters, we are not in exile. Exile is in us. Now, that is certainly an indication that these are perilous times. The people to whom the prophets is speaking in the text are God's people in exile. The liberating word from God through the prophet, through the captives, is simply this. Number one, Reaffirm and reveal God at the center. And as you do that, remember and rehearse your intrinsic worth and dignity. Secondly, remember your ancestors. And as you do that, reconnect and retell the story of your ancestors. And thirdly, reimagine and recommit a future. And as you do that, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. To the captive Jews, it must have seemed almost impossible to escape from the powerful grip of the tyrant Babylon, make the long journey home over harsh territory, and then rebuild their ruined country. Through the prophet, God encourages them with reminders of the impossible things God had already done for them in the past. The very origin of Israel was something of a miracle. God built a nation out of one couple. Even though Abraham and Sarah were far past the age when they might normally expect to have children. The same God is still alive, the prophet says, and he is willing and able to perform a miracle again and restore Jerusalem. The prophet's purpose here is to encourage those who are faithfully trying to be faithful while they are looking to God's promised deliverance. They are living in exile. But God is going to take them home. And paradoxically, he says to them, look forward by looking back. Hmm. 
That sounds like Sankofa to me. Yeah, Sankofa is a Ghanaian word that translated means go back and fetch it. It also refers to a mythical bird whose feet are firmly planted forward while his head is turned backwards, carrying a precious egg in its mouth. It symbolizes the belief that the past serves as a guide for planning the future. This also suggests that looking back into the past and learning from it are essential steps to taking control of one's destiny as well as finding success in the present. Specifically, the prophet tells the Israelites to look back to Israel's original parental pair, Abraham and Sarah. They are the rock from which the exiles were hewn and the quarry from which they were dug. One can see clearly here uh, that irony abounds. The first rock is an image of strength and stability. The exiles torn from their land, their institutions, and some, no doubt, said from their God, hardly seem strong and stable. Yet the prophet called them to remember that they have come from ancestors of unquestioned resolve and perseverance. They carry the same granite in their spirit, even if they feel it had been ground into dust. The metaphor of the rock and the quarry offer a parallel reflection of Israel's origins. Like Abraham's call, the rock emphasized the power of Israel's origin. God called Abraham with a solid and sure promise, just as the rock is solid and sure. Indeed, the rock is frequently nomenclature for God. Hence, Israel's origin in the rock provides the basis for her confidence. The second metaphor, the quarry, means the hole of the pit. Yeah, like Sarah's barren womb, this image is empty. Elsewhere in the Bible, the pit refers to a place of suffering and distance from God. The rock and the pit recall both the firm presence and the empty absence of God in Israel's past. But God's power is to be trusted like a rock, like Abraham's call. However, God's absence, like Sarah's barren wound, like the hole in the pit, is an impossible chasm. But watch this. The hole is not the end of the story. From the impossible, from the disoriented, from the unimaginable suffering, great people can be born. This is the liberating word that God's people in captivity needed to hear. They needed the assurance that their God was still with them, even in captivity. They needed the assurance that there is no place where God is not present. They needed to hear once again that they could continue to trust God even if they could not trace God. Now, I've been trying to pastor some of God's lovable children. You hear what I say? For almost 45 years. And without failure, each time I have stood before them to proclaim God's truth, there's always been that inquisitive gaze on each face. And that gaze said, Pastor, is there any word from the Lord for what I'm experiencing right now? Is there any bomb left in Gilead for my sin-sick soul? In other words, Dr. Goodchamp, my people spoke with the inquisitiveness of a three-year-old, and they wanted to know for me when is God going to show up? <laughs> Liberation is at the heart of all these questions because it is another way of asking, what does the Lord have to say about what I'm going through during financial woes and the stresses and strains of life? Is there any word of hope for me? Black liberating preaching is filled with hope, encouraging listeners to continue moving forward in the face of stormy days. Black liberation preaching 
helps people to believe that regardless of their situation, there is still good news. You see, the political, emotional, and socioeconomic plight of black Americans is an important part of preaching in the black church. And the persons in the pew want to know if there any word from the Lord for them. Those who are stepped on because of their class, their race, their gender, their age, who they love, and other various identifiers deserve to know where God is during their unfair treatment. Those in positions of privilege can easily interpret scripture, however erroneously, from their interests, ambitions, and standards, which rarely, if ever, serve the concerns of those on the society's margins. We can all attest to the fact that black preaching is celebratory, shared by pastors and congregations alike, even if the congregation is virtual. The preaching moment is where God's people, gathered in person or virtually, expects an encounter with God. The celebration happens while showing how, in some way, gospel, the gospel addresses the hardships in their lives. Celebration naturally comes at hearing the promise of liberation and restoration from socially marginalized people. If preaching is to truly transform its hearers' lives, then it must be more than a celebrative event. And Grandma say, I need something to chew on during the weekend days, which means I need something that's going to last. Because black preaching centers on the struggles for social change, preaching can be a place where hopes, fears, and frustrations, joys are poured out in a great emotional outpouring. This outpouring comes because black folk have been held down for so long. And when some, something else happened in our lives to hold us down further, it just adds to the already mounting frustrations and already mounting burdens. Conversely, when something good happens in our lives, that emotional outpouring becomes an extraordinary joy with the sense that something good has finally happened to us. Many of us in this space right here and thousands of spaces elsewhere preach and teach to people who struggle from day to day desperately trying to make the ends meet. And that's difficult when you cannot find the ends. If the preaching that is being done does not seek to transform lives and address these circumstances, it makes a great deal of sense to ask the question, is this preaching really relevant? The pain and suffering that so many of our people feel in these yet-to-be United States results from an uneven social playing field. Those who are on the lower end of this slanted playing field are looking for something that can elevate them to level ground. Preaching liberation in these perilous times can serve as an elevating catalyst for supernatural renewal and social change. If Dr. James Harris is correct when he posits the notion that preaching liberation, I heard you sister, should be the starting point of our proclamation because liberating preaching is transformational, and I do agree with the assessment, then what should our preaching liberation look like? Well, you keep asking good questions. Let me see if I can give you a clue from the prophet Isaiah. If we are going to preach liberation, first of all, reaffirm and reveal God at the center of our being. And as we do that, remember and rehearse our intrinsic worth and dignity. Secondly, have our people to remember our ancestors. And as they do that, reconnect and tell the story of our ancestors. And thirdly, reimagine and reconnect to a future. And as they do that, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Now, from a theological, ethical perspective, when we talk about social justice, when we talk about all of this, it does not begin with social justice. It begins with our relationship with God. What animates our commitment to social justice is our walk with God. If we were walking with God as a society, social justice would not be an issue. 
especially from the black perspective. If in our proclamation, we urge our people to remember and rehearse their intrinsic worth and dignity, then that preaching is liberational. Preaching liberation in these perilous times mean that you and I must remind our people to remember the rock from which they were hewn, the quarry from which they were dug. Remembering this will inevitably cause one to embrace the reality that there have been intrinsic worth divine and derived from the one who is God and who is at our center. Preaching liberation in these perilous times mandate that you and I remind our people that God says, I made you. Sure, they can call you three-fifths of a human being. They may try and even succeed in disenfranchising you. They can do this, that, or the other to you. They can deny you your everything. But the truth is, I made you. This is where our intrinsic dignity, dignity and worth originates, from God and God alone. But part, part of the issue for me, uh, from an ethical perspective, concerns my inability to understand why there are so many so-called Christians who have a problem with social justice. Why is there so much energy expended by so many children of light that merely eventuates in placing so many of God's children in the dark? To know God is to discover your true self. And I found out a while ago that the devaluation of the other only begins after one devalues oneself. It makes you wonder if the antagonists of social justice serve the same God that you and I serve, the God whom the prophet told the captives to keep in the center of their being, the God whom we tell our people to keep in the center of their being. Preaching liberation in these perilous times mandate that you and I urge our people to remember our ancestors. Preaching liberation and being acutely aware of our need to promote social justice call our attention to the greatness of black people. The prophet asked the captives in the scripture I read earlier to reconnect with Abraham and Sarah. And that was good for Isaiah and the captives and the people of their day. But you and I have other ancestors and another story. And we must reconnect with that story. Ours is the story of a resilient people who are image bearers of the architect of the universe. Our history is a history of people with a rich history and an enviable heritage. And it is more urgent now than ever before that we make concerted efforts to ensure that our ancestors and our history are kept alive for generations yet unborn. Let me stick a pen right there. If you, uh, if you ever been in the news any time lately, and I hang my head every time I hear the name of my home state, Florida, trying to take all the history books out, trying to take everything out that has anything with anybody that looks like me. So preachers, we need to be mindful. That there are those who are working on the scenes, behind the scenes, after hours to make certain that generations yet unborn knows nothing about what we have done, nothing about our ancestors. Dante Stewart was correct when he said, and I quote, to be black and to be Christian is to remember the brutality of our experience and the brilliance of our resistance, unquote. Our ancestors were resilient people. We must be also. Lonnie Bunch, you know the name, 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and founding director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture from 2005 to 2019, has astutely said, and I quote him, there is no more powerful force than a people steeped in their history. And there is no higher cause than honoring our struggle and ancestors by remembering, unquote. Our liberation preaching must remind our people of this reality. But having said that, what happens, preachers, when we are co-opted in our attempt to preach liberation? What happens when we become enablers to the very oppressors whose every effort has always been designed to keep our people in exile? 
what our people hear is this. You are a wretch undone. But God whispers to us, preachers, as God did to Israel, as Israel hoped for deliverance out of exile. God says, I created you. And your being is not defined by what they say about you. You need to come to consciousness of what I did when I formed you. Don't let the lie determine your truth. Don't buy into the alternate reality. I created you. But what happens, preachers, when the substance of our preaching is no different than the substance of the persons who are preaching and seeking to keep us in chains in exile? When we dress our sermons, I ain't bother nobody. When we dress our sermons, uh-huh, <laughs> In a nice introduction, a sweet hoop, and a lingering conclusion that has no connection to liberation. We often lead our people to become participants in their oppression, aiding and abetting those who are antagonistic to social justice and liberation. The text says, for those who are reaching out to me, one of the pervasive problems that prevents Many of us, not in this room, from preaching liberation is the simple fact that we are not reaching out to God. No, my sisters and brothers, too many of us, not in this room, are reaching out to prosperity, privilege, prestige, and the American way. And we far too many cases we are doing it by any means necessary. How many folk you got, Doc? And we start judging one another. How big your house? How many can it hold? What that got to do with liberation? Black liberation preaching inclu involves us reminding our people that the character of our behavior in the present is indicative of the future we are seeking. If we have a vision, hear me good, it does not become a vision until we align our behavior with that vision. We can have an eschatological ethic. That is, the substance of our ethics is derived from the fulfilled vision when all things come together, all things are in order. So we cannot live now in a way that contradicts that vision. If we do, we align to ourselves and to others. Black liberation preaching is strengthened and takes on new and powerful dimensions. When we preachers of this gospel re regain the confidence that we can persevere despite modern pandemic manifestations of oppression and injustice. But be well advised, sisters and brothers, black liberation preaching upsets the status quo. Black liberation preaching declares the gospel we preach is a gospel of inclusion, not exclusion. Black liberation preaching Demonstrate the fact that you and I dare to see a vision of a way of being that says we have new standards of accreditation. And our excellence is not defined by exclusion, but by the empowerment of those who have not been historically included. Preachers, do you have the gift of preaching liberation to those who have been marginalized and often excluded? Or... Are you only capable of teaching and preaching those who have always had access? These are perilous times. And preachers, we need to be concerned, as is our God, about social justice and preach liberation. As I meander toward a close. How many times have you heard that? <laughs> 30 minutes later, they still. <laughs> but as I meander toward a close, allow me to drop this in your spirit. Brett Younger made some astute observations with which I agree in an article 2013 edition of Review and Expositor entitled, Calorie Counting Ministers in a Starving World. Seminarians and alums, some of you came to STVU because you wanted the tools to become more efficient, more effective, and successful ministers. We should have told you the truth. 
We should have put it on the website and announced it at the entrance interview. The church has enough ministers who want to be efficient and effective and successful. We need passion, anger, and desire. Those of us who have been doing our best to stand and proclaim will tell you in a New York minute that the church does not need any more ministers who want to maintain the church. We need ministers who will poke and prod the church. The church does not need any more reasonable ministers. We need ministers who will set their hair on fire for what is right. The church has more than enough predictable, conventional, cookie-cutter ministers. We need ardent, zealous, fervent, fiery, incensed, inflamed, engaged, obsessive, and impassioned ministers. The followers of Jesus that the church needs are the mad ones, mad to be saved, mad to save others, mad to save lives, mad to save the world. The ones who are never bored with the church because they are always pushing, provoking, pointing us to that we can do more. God needs outliers, nonconforming, maverick, eccentric, dissidents, and dissenters. The church has enough people keeping rules. We need exceptions to the rules. Ah, don't get me wrong now. Don't get me wrong. Continue to observe your special days at church. But preach liberation. Continue your anniversaries, the church anniversary and the pastor's anniversary. But preach liberation. Go across Broad Street or wherever you got to go across to get to those who are not like you for fellowship and civic engagement and other activities, but preach liberation. Continue to tell the people about their home on high, but also tell them how to navigate these bigoted, hateful, misogynistic, homophobic waters out here on the high seas of racism and preach liberation. Celebrate our victories thus far as a people, but please realize we have not arrived yet. So preach liberation. Celebrate and thank God for the fact you made it out of the hood. But never forget that you and I are obligated to lift as we climb. So go and preach liberation. Be unrelenting, sisters and brothers. Speak truth to power. But as you do that, preach to empower and preach liberation. Did you not know on Sunday mornings our sanctuary started the day as empty boxes? The minister's job is to be an instrument through whom God fills the sanctuary with fury, joy, and revolution. The church can be an electric gathering if we believe that what we do makes a difference. Love makes a difference. Hope can be awakened. And evil can be overcome by living like Christ and sharing what we have. As preachers of this marvelous gospel, you and I are challenged to take advantage of every opportunity presented to us to speak truth to power. But as we do that, speak to empower our people. We are challenged to be a part of our God-given mandate to take care of the least, the lost, the left out, and the marginalized among us. We are challenged, you and I, to make certain that if it is possible, as far as it depends upon us, to preach liberation in these perilous times. God mandates it. God expects it. And God deserves it for God's people and God's glory. Let justice roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream and preach liberation in these perilous times. Ah, I, I, I hear you. I hear you. Still got them questions. I, I hear you. Doc Smith, the prophet told the Israelites in exile to first of all reaffirm and reveal God at the present. And they did that in remembering and rehearsing their intrinsic worth and dignity. They did it and, and we got it. But Dr. Smith, the prophet told the Israelites in exile to Secondly, remember their ancestors, and as they did that, reconnect and tell, retell the story of their ancestors. They did that, and we got it. Dr. Smith, the prophet, told the Israelites in exile, thirdly, to reimagine and reconnect to a future. And as they did that, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Hold up, Dr. Smith. Wait a minute. Pump your brakes. The exiles were not free at the time of the text. And we have not been liberated yet. 
and yet you say rejoice? That's exactly what I said. We have not been liberated yet, but as we preach liberation, we should also rejoice at the same time. But how is it possible, Dr. Smith, to rejoice and we have not been liberated yet? It's possible because you and I can praise God on credit. God is good for it. Liberation has not been fully realized, but it's coming. God said it. We believe it. That settles it. These are perilous times, preachers, so preach liberation. The lowly Nazarene from the ghetto of Nazareth has not returned yet, but he said he was coming back. Did he not? So preach liberation. Preach liberation. Preaching and liberation go together. Preaching and social justice go together. Preaching liberation in these perilous times is necessary. Preach liberation, preachers. Preach liberation, preachers. These are perilous times. Preach liberation, preachers. These are perilous times. Preach liberation. God bless you. STVU Finest. Come on, STVU Finest. Again, as I shared with you, when I became dean, one of my first concerns was the morale of our university, was the sense of pride. I'm a two-time graduate. There's something amazing about STVU grad. Okay, let's try it again. It's something amazing about STVU grads. Okay, anybody at STVU grad, every STVU grad, stand up and holler for yourself right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm grateful to all of you. So, Dr. Smith, that was amazing. That was amazing. That was amazing. Great insight. So a couple of things are going to happen. I always like to build in breaks. The afternoon is free after the last panel, which is in about 1.15, 1.30. Um, so when that last panel is completed, we have a reception in Kingsley. How many of you have never been to Kingsley? Let me see your hand. Okay. Kingsley is the School of Theology's sacred space. That's our sacred space. When I was here in the 80s, it was C.D. King building. And we were moved to Kingsley. And Kingsley is this space that when you walk in, first time I walked in as dean, I felt the spirit of the 11 men who had gone before me. J.D. Olis Roberts, Paul Nichols, Miles Jones. I felt the spirit of John Kenny. When I walked in, I knew I was on holy ground. Again, you may never get it, but there's something special about being a part of STVU. There's something special about being a graduate of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union. These grounds have the blood of our ancestors. A white man fell in love with a black woman and her courage and strength produced a school that is producing you. To God be the glory that's liberation. So we're getting ready for a panel discussion, so we're going to start making some transitions. Uh, Dr. Harris has some of his books out there that support our faculty. I'm also offering to any faculty member who has books to bring your books, and you can set up and sell them um, here because we want you to support our faculty. Amen? So, so, we, so we, we're getting set up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ellison Jones, church clerk. <laughs> um, on Thursday, Dr. King Walker is our preacher. I saw King around here somewhere. King, stand up, man. Stand up, stand up, stand up. He's a, he's a grad. And it's the university service. So this year, uh, Dr. Dr. Mrs. Ida Jones, I don't know if she's still here. There she is, Mrs. Ida Jones. Can we celebrate Mrs. Ida Jones? <laughs> Dr. Guchamp is the queen mother of the seminary, but she's the queen mother of the university. Yeah, she's amazing. And so she's leading our university in a less share and less care for our neighbors in need. And we are, we are receiving, and there, there, there are these little baskets over here. I want to thank um, our team who has taken lead with this. And, um, and there, there's a food drive for Thanksgiving, and they're asking all student organizations. And so School of Theology, with us being on campus, if you would purchase something and, and bring it and drop it off. So on Thursday, School of Theology can be represented. Amen. I do want to acknowledge our Dean of Chapel, Dr. Richard Price. Can we celebrate Dr. Price? Amen. He's doing an amazing job of kind of re-energizing worship on this campus. Uh, it's, it's a great challenge. So, uh, as always, faculty that's here, all faculty, would you please stand? All faculty, all faculty. Let's celebrate Dr. McKenzie, Dr. West, Dr. Wafranaka, Dr. Kim. Welcome back, Dr. Gregory Howard. Dr. Boykin Sanders, our university professor, and of course, the beloved Dr. Debra Martin. Glad she's back. Dr. Jansen is outside um, working with registration. And so thank you all. We do have a best in class faculty, Dr. Goolchamp, um, last night. Dr. Harris is outside as well. So we're gonna take another, what time is it? It's 11.07. We're gonna take uh, about a 10 minute break. We'll start again around, around 11.15. Um, as they transition. Oh, yes, Lord, you're right. Can we celebrate Dean Emeritus John Kinney? Where, where is Dean Emeritus? Would you stand? If there's a queen mother, there's a king daddy. What's wrong with me? That's why you don't call names in church. Dr. Mary Young. Many of us got through here because either Delbert Martin or Mary Young got us through. Anybody remember Ella Grimes? Ella Grimes, man. Wow. There's a whole lot of people that came before y'all. And I want to challenge y'all and hear me, and then we'll take our break. Please hear me. One of my goals as dean is for this generation to know your history of this school. It ain't start with this present faculty. There are men and women this last year, maybe this year we buried Dr. Gloria Taylor, who taught Christian education. This chapel is named after one of the most important men in the history of the school, Dr. Alex B. James. Ellison Hall is named after John Malkadon. Henderson Hall. These sacred spaces are often named after black preachers. You can do, you can say whatever you want to say. Virginia Union is a school that survives because the Lord won't let it die. This is holy ground. This is holy ground. Too much good happens on these grounds. Don't let financial aid and student accounts make you miss. You are on holy ground. Thank God. Thank God. So we're going to take a break, and, um, and we'll come back around 1120. Um, and then, because by the time we finish everything, it'll still be around 130, 140. And you'll have the rest of the time to get ready for tonight. Dr. Jerry Carter 
is our preacher tonight. He, he, he teaches preaching here, and so he's our preacher tonight. So come on, come on, you can stay and take a break if you choose to. Um, God bless you, and we'll be back at 1120. Do not leave here. I said, yes. Oh, can, can they put it back up? Okay, okay, all right.